Way back in the 1700s, a Swedish botanist named Carolus Linnaeus came up with a standard way to categorize known life on Earth. His method was called the Systema Naturae, and you probably can remember learning the basic groups of this system at some point in school. Those categories of living things, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, all the way down to the smallest unit of biodiversity in Linnaeus' system, the species. What Linnaeus saw was that life could be organized into a series of groups within groups. This was revolutionary, and it gave scientists a common language for talking about all life on Earth. Linnaeus' system was so powerful that we still use some of the basic principles of naming he established so long ago. For example, when we devise names for newly discovered animals, we must first investigate the characteristics that they share with other organisms and also distinguish them through a clear diagnostic suite of traits that are unique to the new animal. Eventually, once all of this comparative study is done, we may get to name new animals with their very own genus and species name. That's why dinosaurs are known by genus and species names, like Tyrannosaurus rex. It's all thanks to Linnaeus. Still, when Linnaeus developed his system, no one had yet figured out why organisms shared characteristics. How do these shared traits arise and what do they mean? The key to unlocking this mystery wouldn't be discovered until a century later, when two other revolutionary scientists hit the scene and changed the way that we view the history of life on Earth. This lesson is all about the important contributions of Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, who both independently came up with a theory of evolution by natural selection. This guiding principle underlies all biology, including paleobiology, and allows us to understand why life on Earth shares features. Their big idea may seem obvious now, but it sparked a scientific revolution equivalent to the realization that elements could be organized in a periodic table, or that space and time were linked. It was that earth-shattering. We usually give Charles Darwin all the credit for this important scientific innovation, and there's no denying that his contributions to the theory were by far the most extensive. He originally consolidated his thoughts in the 1820s, when he was only in his early 20s while sailing the globe on the HMS Beagle. His visits to South America and the Galapagos Islands provided the raw materials for the theory which he built upon over the next decades with hundreds of pages of evidentiary support. Alfred Russell Wallace looked up to Darwin and followed in his mentor's footsteps as a naturalist on his very own voyage on the other side of the globe. In the Indonesia archipelago, an island chain with interesting biological similarities to the Galapagos, Wallace hit upon the same core ideas and shared his thoughts with Darwin. Together, they shared their ideas on the origin of species to the prestigious Linnaean Society of London in 1858. Just a year later, Darwin published his magnum opus on the origin of species, in which he articulated his data and arguments for how species come into being, even crediting Wallace's contributions as headings of some of the chapters. For the first time, a mechanism for the origin of species known as natural selection, provided a simple way for new species to form without the pre-planning or handiwork of a supernatural creator. Instead, it was all up to nature. Every organism within a population varies in its ability to acquire resources, like food, mates, and territory. Because these resources are limited, organisms must compete for them. Limited resources mean that not all organisms can reproduce to their full potential. Those best suited to gathering resources are more likely to survive and reproduce and potentially pass their special traits on to their offspring. Over time, these traits may become more prevalent in some, but not in others, and these differences in traits allow us to identify a new species. This view highlights that all life on Earth shares a common ancestry. The tree-like branching pattern of shared and divergent evolutionary histories result in the hierarchical groups first scientifically recognized by Linnaeus. Organisms that share a more recent common ancestry fit into smaller groups 
whereas larger groups share a more distant common ancestry. We can think of this in the same way that we trace out our own family tree. We often resemble our parents and grandparents and probably share specific features with our siblings and with our own children. But we're all a little bit different, but we've inherited a few common features that highlight our close relationships. Maybe it's our hair color or the shapes of our noses or the sound of our voices. These traits shared among family members reflect our genealogy. If we pull back from a single family group to the bigger history of life, the same branching set of relationships becomes apparent. For example, consider all land animals or tetrapods. Whether you're a lizard, a mammal, or a bird, all of these organisms share the presence of four legs because we inherited them from our ancient common ancestor. Our front legs may have evolved into arms or wings, but the core components from bones to muscles, nerves, and blood vessels all point to their long history of evolutionary sameness. When we line up the hierarchical categories established by Linnaeus, shown here for Triceratops and for humans, we can see the parts of our history that are shared and the point of our divergence from our shared ancestor to head on our own evolutionary paths. This view of life allows us to trace shared ancestry among all life on Earth, from humans to plants, slime molds, bacteria, and yeah, even dinosaurs. In addition to understanding life's interconnections, another important shift was the realization that there is no such thing as striving when it comes to evolution. Before Darwin and Wallace's big idea, scientists viewed the origin and evolution of species through a lens of getting better and better over time, in a directed and intentional way. Now we realize that change, success, and survival is all about the ways that species adapt to their environments. In reality, fitness is always relative and must be viewed in the context of a constantly changing environment. Instead of a ladder of improvement, species exist in a vacillating landscape of change. Sometimes you're on top of the roller coaster, but often you're slowly sliding away from a fitness peak or hanging out in the survival of the good enough zone. Often environments change quickly enough that species evolution simply can't keep pace. And when this happens, it can result in extinction. It's not that extinct animals are better, worse, or even poorly adapted. It only means that environmental shifts outpaced evolution's ability to modify their genomes quickly enough to keep up. We'll come back to this idea in later lessons. As our understanding of evolution has developed over time, the fundamentals have been supported by data from sources as diverse as comparative anatomy, developmental biology, studies of the genomes of living organisms, and yes, the fossil record. With the development of these sciences, we've come to realize that while many of Linnaeus's original groups actually represent the nature of common ancestry and have stood the test of time, other groups mistakenly lumped together creatures that were distantly related because they shared some superficial similarities. As it turns out, there are different ways of being the same. Sir Richard Owen, the very same renowned British comparative anatomist responsible for initially establishing the group that we know and love as Dinosauria, he was also responsible for one of the key unifying principles that helps us understand one type of similarity. This is the principle called homology. Homologies are traits that are shared because they are derived from a common ancestor. They help us identify true evolutionary groups that we call monophyletic groups. Now that we know evolution occurs, we always want our classifications to reflect this evolutionary history. Homologous traits may have undergone evolution that makes them look or work distinctively in each descendant group. So even though these traits have a common origin, they can still have very different functions. Still, we can trace their shared history through our evolutionary trees. For example, when we consider all four-legged animals that evolved on land, the tetrapods, we can see that their arms and legs are built from the same basic building blocks, 
one big bone at the top, two smaller bones down below, and a whole bunch of little bones at the end. This basic arrangement is present whether we look at humans, pterosaurs, whales, or dinosaurs. Evolution has worked with the raw material of this limb anatomy to mold fins, wings, and even the loss of limbs in animals like snakes, which are also derived from four-legged ancestors. Evolution might change the morphology of a descendant group, making it tough to spot the similarities, but they are nevertheless there. In contrast, sometimes the shared similarities that we spot are the result of a process that we call convergent evolution. I like to think of this process as evolution hitting upon or converging upon the same anatomical solution to a common functional problem. Since these traits share specific functions, they often look alike, but they are built from different underlying structures. This type of similarity is distinct from homology and essentially results from evolution repeating itself. These types of characteristics can easily mislead us when it comes to building evolutionary trees, since we might group together creatures that are quite distantly related. In actuality, though, these analogous traits don't provide evidence for shared ancestry, but instead highlight evolution's remarkable way of finding solutions that work well in an environment. Back in the age of Linnaeus, sometimes organismal groups were mistakenly diagnosed by the presence of such analogous features. For example, Linnaeus originally grouped birds and mammals together into a tribe he called Homeothermia because they were the only known warm-blooded animals on Earth. Now that we've thoroughly studied these disparate animals, we know that they evolved their unique types of warm-bloodedness independently. Once you strip down the features and really dissect the data, the differences in the ways that these groups thermoregulate highlights their distant ancestry. A few other examples of convergent evolution relate to topics we'll return to in future lessons. If you take a look at all marine animals that began life on land, think of whales, dolphins, walruses, and even sea turtles, they share some features with sharks, which have always lived in the ocean. The similarities of torpedo-like body shapes, tail flukes, fins, and even countershading are all indications of superficial similarities. A casual observer might imagine that they were all very close relatives just because of these superficial features. Another great example is the evolution of wings in birds, bats, and pterosaurs. At first glance, you might imagine that wing-bearing animals might be each other's closest relatives. But if you look a little more closely, their differences become very clear and makes it easier to see how each of these animals evolved their wings independently from different common ancestors. Keep this concept of convergent evolution in mind for some of our future lessons. To help us test different competing hypotheses of evolution, we now use a method called cladistics, first developed back in the 1950s. In cladistics, we enter data into a computer program on different features in a group of interest, as well as a comparative outgroup. We then ask the program to organize the data using a pretty basic principle called parsimony to determine which organisms are more closely related to others by distributing the various features in the simplest or most straightforward way possible. This method results in a branching tree-like diagram where close relatives are nearer to one another on the tree and share some group of diagnostic features that would allow us to place a newly discovered animal within the group down the road. Cladistics is powerful because it builds testable hypotheses of how different organisms are related and which characteristics they share. And because it works from general principles, another scientist could take the same data and find the same answer. Or they could add in a newly discovered fossil species and revise the tree to incorporate these new data. Now that we use cladistics to help us build evolutionary trees, we've realized that some of the earlier groups created by the Linnaean taxonomic system hide important parts of the evolutionary story. Take, for example, birds. In the Linnaean system, birds belong in their own special group, aves, because they seem so different from other living creatures. They're warm-blooded, have feathers, and beaks instead of teeth. 
On the other hand, animals like turtles, snakes, lizards, and crocodiles belonged to a different group, reptilia, because of their cold-blooded, scaly-skinned biology. But being scaly and cold-blooded are actually primitive features for land-living animals, not specializations. There actually aren't any features that are uniquely shared by these quote-unquote reptiles that aren't also shared by birds. When we employ cladistic methods for grouping organisms based on their homologous features, we realize that birds are a part of reptilia. Even more interesting, even though they look pretty different, birds and crocodiles are more closely related to each other than either is to lizards. Even more interesting than that, dinosaurs also fit within this group, but it turns out that they are even more closely related to birds than they are to crocodiles. Evolution holds the dinosauria together, and evolution is the reason that we can say confidently that birds are dinosaurs. With evolution in mind, we can connect the dots between these different groups and between other dinosaur groups and move even farther out to a broader array of backboned animals with distinctive trails of homologous anatomical breadcrumbs. In earlier lessons, we learned about the two major tribes of dinosaurs, the Saurischia and the Ornithischia. Now, armed with our new understanding of evolution, we can explore these a bit more in their evolutionary context. Let's begin with Ornithischia. Remember that Ornithischia included a bunch of different creatures known for their backward-facing pubis, their wild ornamentation, and their specializations for eating plants. These same general features help us figure out which Ornithischian groups are most closely related to one another. Our old friends, the tank-like ankylosaurs and plated and spiked stegosaurs, are each other's closest relatives. They are grouped together in a special Ornithischian subgroup called Thyreophora. This name translates to shield bearers. And as you probably guessed, most members of the group are well known for the bony osteoderms that grow in their skin. The large group of Ornithischians that we call Ornithopoda is full of a variety of disparate body plants. It includes little herbivores like Hypsilophodon, the famous early discovered beak dinosaur, Iguanodon, and most famously the duck-billed dinos with fancy headgear that we call the hadrosaurs. The head crests of hadrosaurs are built of an elaboration of a couple skull bones, the bones of the nose, called the nasal bones, and the bones of the forehead, called the frontals. These bones were stretched out and coiled around to create fancy crests that we think may have played a role in vocalization for these gregarious creatures. The final group of Ornithischians is also all about the headgear. The Pachycephalosauria, those dome-headed bipeds, and the horned and frilled Ceratopsia are more closely related to one another than they are to any other dinosaur group. The reason is reflected in their special conjoined group name. Marginocephalia. While hadrosaurs elaborate the nose and forehead bones to build their headgear, marginocephalians instead elaborate the back part of their skulls by building a shelf-like projection. That's where the name marginocephalia comes from. It translates to ridge-headed. Let's turn our attention now to the other major tribe of dinosaurs, the Saurischia. This group includes both herbivores and carnivores, from the humongous to the teeny tiny. It's a little bit simpler than the complex tree of Ornithopoda. Saurischia can really be divided into just two groups, the Sauropodomorpha and the Theropoda. Sauropodomorpha includes the animals we used to think of as prosauropods, an early group of globally distributed herbivores, as well as the giant sauropods. This is a perfect example of the realization that our old classifications based only upon superficial similarities weren't quite right. When paleontologists first discovered prosauropods and sauropods, it was tough to imagine a connection between them. But nowadays, we realize that a specific group of larger-bodied prosauropods likely diversified into the ancestral sauropods. Sauropods inherited their small heads, long necks, and big guts from their prosauropod ancestors. But in other ways, they're completely distinctive. 
As you may remember, I've spent a lot of my career studying a specific subgroup of sauropods called Titanosauria. These include dinosaurs that lived up to the very end of the Cretaceous period, and strangely enough, their fossil record yielded the first occurrence of an osteoderm with a sauropod skeleton. Early in the days of exploring Madagascar's ancient fossil record, the discovery of a single osteoderm prompted some paleontologists back in the 1800s and early 1900s to hypothesize that there must be an ankylosaur yet to be discovered in the rocks there. This was just because of the osteoderm. No other bones had been found to support this notion. The first titanosaur described from Madagascar included a chunk of an osteoderm, and the scientists proposing that new species did so a bit cautiously, worried that he might be wrong to stick all those bony bits and pieces together. It took a hundred years and lots of additional discoveries for that association to be confirmed. Now we know that some titanosaurs had osteoderms, which they convergently evolved with their thyreophoran cousins, but likely used them in a completely different manner. Instead of for protection, we think that these osteoderms might have been useful for mineral storage, and that would have allowed these giant dinosaurs to steal minerals from their own bodies to shell eggs without compromising the integrity of their limbs. The other group of Sauroscia is Theropoda, which includes all the meat-eating dinosaurs. Along one branch of this very big and diverse theropod family tree is a special group known as the Manoraptora. It is from this group that we find the origin of birds. In our next few lessons, we'll drill down into this part of the tree to gain an understanding of how so many birdy features first show up among the diversity of dinosaur precursors. Okay, at this point you may be thinking, got it. I understand that evolution sometimes creates similar solutions to functional problems, and that we want our own classifications to reflect the real, shared ancestry of creatures recorded by their homologous features. But wait a minute! Where do the swimming and non-bird flying dinosaurs fit into this story? What about the sailback creatures like Demetrodon? Great question. To answer that, we have to step back from our view of the dinosaur part of the Tree of Life, because as we learned in a previous lesson, None of these animals are actually dinosaurs. To understand why, let's go back, way back, to the huge group of hard-shelled, egg-laying terrestrial vertebrates called amniotes. This group is special because their unique eggs distinguish them from amphibians, who have to lay their eggs in a watery world. Amniotes break the bonds of being tied to water for reproduction, and fully venture out for a life lived on dry land. Amniota includes a few important groups. One, called the synapsida, leads to mammals, though it starts out scaly and cold-blooded, just like other reptiles. It is here that the sail-backed reptiles like Demetrodon fit into this story. Demetrodon shares special features of its skull with other synapsids, including us. It turns out that Demetrodon is actually more closely related to us than it is to any dinosaur. The other group, called Sauropsida, is where to look for the other swimming and flying beasts of the Mesozoic. Sauropsida contains a whole bunch of creatures we typically think of as reptiles. You got it, the lizardy, snaky, turtley, crocky, and dino-y creatures. Like so many evolutionary groups, we divide sauropsids into two big tribes, the lepidosauromorphs, where lizards and snakes fit in, and the archosauromorphs, where crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds belong. When we dive into the evolution of the Mesozoic swimming reptiles, we realize that the swimmers are actually more closely related to lizards and snakes. Even cooler, each of the three most common marine reptile groups evolved their own specializations separately. They aren't each other's closest relatives. And the flying reptiles we call pterosaurs? They are like second cousins to dinosaurs, a bit more closely related to dinosaurs than to crocodiles, but lacking the key specializations that make dinosaurs, well, dinosaurs. So next time you buy some dinosaur toys, and find things like sailback Demetrodon, flying pterosaurs, and swimming plesiosaurs tucked inside, 
you'll know not only that it's wrong, but why it's wrong. Though distantly related, these creatures are a part of a bigger, broader evolutionary story that makes life in deep time so much more interesting. In our next lesson, we're going to examine the evolutionary link between dinosaurs and modern birds and find out why we think the feathered friends you see by the bird feeder are more interesting than you may have believed. See you then.